In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I finally printed that prayer off in English. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now at the hour of our death. Amen. Direct, we beseech thee, O Lord, our prayers and actions by thy holy inspiration, and carry them on by thy gracious assistance so that every work of ours may always begin with Thee, and through Thee come to completion, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Immaculate Mediatrix of all graces, pray, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So welcome back. Um, unfortunately, for the next couple weeks, there's going to be on and off, on and off, because... We have Holy Week coming up, and then we also have um, this hall. I guess this has been rented out or something a couple different times. So on a Tuesday, so we'll have to juggle things for the next. But we could probably wrap everything up in four more weeks, I would presume. But the next week, because it's already Holy Week, might be good maybe to not have something um, because all the festivities. It's difficult to get everything ready. And then the whole Easter week, um, Easter week we already have that this the halls rented out, so we're not able to be here on Easter week, so Tuesday. So we'll we'll keep thinking about what the, how to how to move forward. So now let's get into the mass. The first thing I wanted to address was I was asked when you when you go to participate for your first time, like at Latin mass, and you're dealing with the liturgy that now is uh, directed uh, directly towards God and seems to turn its back on you is what it seems if you've never participated in it before. That's the language we use today. Not realizing that the liturgy is for God, so we feel like God's kind of... So we're not sure how to participate when we don't understand really what's going on. We haven't picked up the rhythm yet on how to move through the Mass, how to follow the Mass, how we're supposed to participate in the Mass what that axio is of our prayer uh, in the participation. Well, first and foremost, um, it's like anything. I mean, it, learning a new language, you're lost. I don't know if anybody's been to another country where you try to learn another language, but you're lost for, for at least months. Months where you have no idea what's going on. People are talking to you, telling you to do things. After a while, you think you know what you're supposed to be doing and still you don't know and everybody laughs at you because you're doing the wrong thing all the time. But it's because you don't know the language. You don't know how to communicate yet. Um, the Mass is, par excellence, a, 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 sacred, a sacred language being used in a sacred way with God. So it's, it's even more difficult to penetrate into. <clears throat> so how do we, how, what do we do? You hang in there. First and foremost, you've got to hang in there. Just like learn the language, the longer you're there, even if you don't study the language, you learn it. Because children learn how to speak languages. Just like humans learn how to, adults, when you get older, you go to another country, eventually it might take you, it takes younger people three months usually to learn a language. It might take you, if you're older, a year, maybe a year and a half, and maybe you don't even master it, but you'll be able to communicate. It's going to be the same way in um, entering into something that's so profound and of a different language and of different customs. You're entering into a culture and a world that's divine. And it's already difficult for us to understand. If you grew up in it, it would be different. But since you're entering into it most times, uh, having never probably seen it before, it creates problems with knowing what to do. We've conformed ourselves to participating through action and, and word. Uh, and now you find yourself kneeling and staring at a priest, the priest's back, not understanding that you are in union with the priest and the priest is offering something to God and that's the difference between horizontal and vertical liturgy vertical liturgy is the divine liturgy the Catholic Church has always known horizontal liturgy is kind of this new way we participate in liturgy the speaking the priest speaking to the people the people back and what we'll talk about today the entrance of mass this is where you get almost every mass today starts with good morning everyone are you joking me? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, good morning, everyone. Okay? Um, 
if we want to consider that uh, vertical, I don't know, but it seems pretty horizontal. Good morning, everyone. So in learning how to participate, one, first principle, hang in there. Second principle would be do a little bit of study. There's the book, um, and somebody here has brought it, but the incredible, uh, incredible Catholic Mass, that's a good one. The, the Treasures of the Mass, written by Saint, that's a small little booklet written by uh, Saint um, Leonard of Port Maurice. That's a nice little, nice little book. To, but if you read some of these books on the, on the Holy Liturgy, written by the saints in times past, they really will help you to understand how to open that devotion, which is your love for the Mass, and be able to pour yourself into and that's the action of your participation, the pouring yourself into that liturgy during the, uh, during the Holy Sacrifice. Uh, the little red booklets are helpful, but even if you can get a, a hand missile, those, those help out well because the hand missiles, they have everything in them. That's what really got me when I first started seeing Latin Mass was I didn't even know what the catechism was because I, I hadn't even heard the word before. And now I have a hand missile that had a brief catechism of the Catholic faith. It had all the vestments, what mass was, an explanation of mass, and then it goes through the whole mass, and then it had all these prayers and things like that to uh, uh, to to nurture your prayer life in the morning and at evening during the day. So you had this whole compendium of prayer just in the little book that you take the mass with you. I would encourage that too. You can get different kinds. That uh, here in America, it's real popular. The Father of the Sons, and I hear he's buried just right over in Cincinnati. Father of the Sons. Very, very famous uh, good father that made all these prayer books and things like that available. Baroni's Press sells one now that's very, very common. Angelus Press makes a very good one. I actually preferred theirs. It was set, set, set up very, very well. It's, it's even a bit thinner. Uh, but it, they're all, they're all, they're all going to be pricey. They're all pricey. But even if you get one that's older, that's okay. It'll, it'll work too. You can get one that's older. Any questions on participation at Mass? Why don't we do this? I'll, I'll go through, and then if you do have questions on that, ask at the um, at the break when I have when I when I take questions. So the start of the mass. First, we want to just look at, and I want to kind of race through this a little bit if I can, but you know that never happens. So misa, y'all. Yeah. Quick question: The Father of the Sons, that's all I've heard that recommended. Is that at the 1962 Holy Week or the 19, pre 1965? Well, it just depends on the year you get. Uh, most of his, I. I, I'm not an expert on the hand missiles because I just had one of those from uh, Angelus Press. And I, I always really yeah, liked I it. Angelus, but I know that as the one yeah. I have is the 1962. That's right. So the Saint, Andrew, is it Andrew? Saint Andrews, yeah. That one has the on, also on the website uh, pre1955.com for the for the there's a there's also a Saint Andrews on there that's downloadable, but I don't know how that's going to help you out. But it, it is on there, it's downloadable. But the St. Andrews is a good one. Any Anyone before 1955 is going to have all the good stuff in it. It'll just depend. See, these hand missiles, it all depends on how they lay it out. People prefer them on how they're laid out. They, they, they like, um, when it comes to like the canon of the Mass, they're set up differently. Some people like it set up one way. Some people like it set up the other way. Some people like the columns with the English and the Latin. Some people like the Latin on one page and the English on another page. It has to do with your preference. And so uh, Father Lasanche, you get a big, a big thick one. That has all kinds of stuff in it. People like that. Um, so anyways, it, it well, really comes down to it. Well, I mean, it'll have, it, 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 it'll have the, the, the catechism in there that has a nice explanation of the Mass. They almost all have these different things, but they have them in different ways because they're different hand missiles. Follow the songs. What I heard is you don't have to jump around as much. I don't have one. I have a uh, Angelus Press. Yeah. But Taylor Marshall talks about it. He doesn't have to jump. Okay. The gospels because they have them in there. They repeat stuff. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. He just puts them in. That's why it's thicker, probably. Yeah. Yeah, instead of abbreviating, that makes sense. So misa. There's two different misas. Misas, we used to say misa, it's dismissal. It has to do with dismissal or missio being, you can leave, you can leave. They used to say it at two different times in the Mass. So there's a double, uh, there was the Mass of the Catechumens was the first one, when you'd say, um, ita misa est. It'd be right before the, well, there's, there's two different takes on this, it probably has to do with two different time periods, but it used to happen right before the Gospel. Then in other places it happened, like at Rome, 
uh, Fortescue talks about it happened before the gospel. So right after the epistle, probably they had the gradual and stuff like that, then, then they would say, the deacon would say, I say deacon because the normative way to say mass is a solemn high mass. That's normative. Never think it's a special thing. It's special today because we don't have a priest and deacon, whatever, but the missal itself, even the last document, um, it was put out by Bernini and under Pius XII, uh, but it was that, um, it, it was the document on liturgy and music. Uh, it still referred to the missal language directly from it, and this comes from the Ritus Servandus, it's usually in the missal. Ritus Servandus is like an official explanation of the liturgy in the front of every missal. It talked about the normative mass was a solemn high mass with deacon and subdeacon. After that, a sung mass. After that, a low mass. So low mass isn't the norman. No, low mass meaning when you have mass where the, there's just a priest with a server and everything said, uh, nothing sung, that's a low mass. A sung mass is when you have either incense or no incense. Before, if you had incense, you were only allowed to have a deacon. Then there was a permission where you, as long as you had a master ceremonies. So that's called a misa cantata is what we call it now. That's a new thing. That comes from newer rubrics. Before that, you could have a sung mass where the chalice was on the altar and you didn't have incense, but everything was sung. So that's a high mass and you had the candles lit. Uh, or you had the solemn high mass with deacon and subdeacon. Like I said, is the normative way to have mass, or at least should be. Every day mass would, would have been with a deacon and subdeacon. So the deacon would have turned and said, Ita misa est, or dimit, uh, misa, or uh, however they did it, and they would leave. And they would go, these were the people that were catechumens or penitents. People who were not in, uh, that, that had to do public penance. So they were allowed, they were permitted to come to Mass, but they were not permitted to participate in the Holy of Holies from the, off, from the Gospel, well, we'll just say from the offertory on. <clears throat> So the twofold uh, dismissal took place at the, uh, at the Eucharistic sacrifice, that is, before the offertory. The catechumens, the catechumens and penitents were permitted to assist along with the faithful assembled at divine worship and to be present at the readings or discourses. So in some places they were there for the gospel and they were there for the homily or the sermon, uh, more properly put, but were formally dismissed after the gospel or the sermon, and then uh, and to them also the dismissal was formally announced at the conclusion of the services. That is, those who participate in the rest of the service, they were they were given another itemisa. They were told to leave afterwards. Oh, there's that. Itemisa um, go. It's it it is dismissed. Now, another commentary that I didn't look up to put in here um, that I think comes from a more of a historical standpoint is in, in more recent times, how far back I don't know, but there was the Benedicamus Domino on penitential days and there's the Ita Misa Est on, on, on feast days. Because on, on penitential days, you didn't leave after Mass. They didn't tell you to leave because there was a catechism afterwards, there were stations of the cross, there was some kind of penitential service, there was other prayers to be done by the Christian community, and so you weren't released. Now you gotta remember after Council of Trent as well, the catechism had to be preached, it had to be taught in a cycle of every five years. The whole catechism had to be taught to the people. We find ourselves right now in the, in the post-Vatican church more ignorant probably than what they were then. That was a big ignorance problem at the time of the Reformation, uh, before Council of Trent, because Luther even, he, he printed a catechism right away, changed the catechism a little bit, gave a curse and said, whoever doesn't follow this, let the curse of Peter and Paul, blah, 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 fall on them, and started to change the faith by catechizing the faith in a different way. And that's really where the split started to come with the simple faithful. So the Council of Trent said, the people need to be catechized, and they need to be catechized especially in their participation in the sacraments, so especially at Mass, because most Catholics really only have contact with the, the, with the Church through Mass. That's why Mass has to be, in and of itself, a sermon, a type of sermon. 
Now, we might think that's strange because it might be difficult for some of us to participate in Mass, so we don't know how it's supposed to speak to us. But that's why we study it. The more we study it, the more we start to realize the depth of it, and it starts to form us in our spiritual life. It has a whole depth of spirituality that's with it about sacrifice, and that's what we're going to get into now with uh, going through all the different parts of the Mass. Then on feast days, when there was actually that itemisa s at the very end, you get the blessing, then the itemisa s, and they, uh, they go. I'm sorry, the itemisa s, then the blessing, and then they go. There would be the, uh, that's because it was a feast day. It was a feast day, and they were to go home and, you know, enjoy the day with their families, and there wasn't going to be catechism, there wasn't going to be penitential services. It was, it was of, a, of a different nature. Period when the when the name Misa was first applied to the celebration of the Eucharistic mystery, the strictest discipline of secrecy was enforced. This is why we use the word Misa. Well, it's for the dismissal. Why do we call Mass itself dismissal? We know before it was called Cena Domini, um, the the because it was on Sunday, so the the uh, the Supper of the Lord, and we did on on Sundays. And there was the uh, the Eucharist for Thanksgiving, and it has a host of other names. Why did we get to Misa? You got to remember, during the persecutions, they were constantly sending the false brethren into the congregations to root out who the Christians were and turn them over. So to hide this a little bit from public knowledge, they called it misa, dismissal. Who's going to think their services are called dismissal? And so they started referring to it. This is at least one theory that during these strictest times of discipline of secrecy. Um, the mode of calling the holy sacrifice is well fitted to conceal the holy mysteries from the uninitiated, those who weren't yet members of the congregation or the, of the faith. This double, this double ita, misa, est, to, um, is this way to communicate the venerable nature of the liturgy. The, uh, the, first, the first ita misa est that happened before consecration for the catechumens and the penitents it's to communicate its purity, and the second to admonish the faithful not to leave until they had rendered honor and glory unto God and had been enriched with the fullness of heavenly gifts and blessings. Sounds good, huh? So even the second one was there. We as, as uh, submissive and obedient sons of the church is to wait for the church to tell us when to leave. Now, don't we see this as a big problem now? In a lot of churches... You go, you receive communion, you walk straight out the door. Uh, big problem. The Ita Misa S comes after there's already been a Thanksgiving. We you think, when, when did we do a Thanksgiving? Well, there's an antiphon. It's called the communion antiphon. There's a communion, there's a post-communion, sorry, the post-communion antiphon. That's part of the Thanksgiving. If they would hold on just a little bit longer, there's also a final gospel, which serves as a Thanksgiving as well. But the Ita Misa Est is a sign that now, now they can leave. But we all know that we're going to wait and say the prayers at the foot of the altar, if there are some, um, or wait till the priest processes out, etc. So the organic development, when did the first, when was the first Mass said? Now, first, first point on organic development, we do not have a Mass that comes from the Jews. We don't have a mass that comes from some pagan worship somewhere either. We don't have, uh, our different rites don't come down to us from something we learn from somebody else. Well, except for the fact that they come from Christ. And Christ gave them to the apostles. And the apostles taught them to the churches that they founded. And the men that they made bishops there in those churches diligently kept these practices. It wasn't until later that these practices started to develop organically dependent on the place and the need of the people that were there. And that's where you start to get different uh, rites within the church, different ways of living this same liturgy. We'll see it more as well. There's a quote I think I have in here somewhere about St. Peter. St. Peter brings the liturgy um, as a seed to the Roman church, and he plants it, or he brings it as a tender little plant and plants it, and over time it becomes this this large fruit-bearing tree with large branches and whatever else, new branches sprouting out every year, meaning a continued organic development. We don't have a liturgy, nor have we ever had a liturgy that's stagnant. It, it doesn't just stop. 
because the faith of the people doesn't stop, nor does the life of the Holy Ghost, the sanctifier amongst his people ever stop. The first Mass, they say, was said, sometimes we have to think about that, don't we? We think, well, were they saying, were they saying Mass while they were waiting for our Lord? Did they, did they say it the next day after our Lord uh, was in the tomb? Did they start saying Mass? Well, could they have said Mass before Pentecost, before the coming of the Holy Ghost, who, who plays a part in Mass, where there's that epiclesis, which is the invocation of the Holy Ghost? Could it have happened? Mary Vigreda says that it was on the octave day, the octave day of Pentecost, so the, the Holy Ghost comes on uh, Pentecost Sunday, and then the octave day, eight days later, they would have said their first Mass. She says it that way. Others say, well, at least Whit Sunday. Whit Sunday, um, I think Whit Sunday is uh, the octave day, isn't it? I always get confused. These are English terms, and I always get confused on all of them. So, It wasn't said before Pentecost, most likely. We wouldn't have had it before Pentecost because they still hadn't had the sanctifier come. And uh, anyways, after, after Pentecost on, there would have been uh, Holy Mass offered by the apostles and then taught to others. The first, offering of the, Holy Sac the first offering of the Holy Sacrifice by our Lord was the rule and the model of the apostles and the essential and fundamental features of the sacrificial rite introduced and enlarged upon the apostles were preserved with fidelity and reverence in the churches founded by them and their successors. But in the course of time, according as, uh, accordingly as it was deemed necessary or expedient, it was always more and more developed, enriched, and perfected, yet after a different manner, in the various churches of East and West. The Lord, uh, quote, I'm not sure where it comes from, but the Lord never ceases to be present to his beloved, his beloved spouse, the church, never fails to be at her side and her office of teaching and to accompany her in her operation with, with his blessing. Consequently, he, has, he had the power as he also had the will to bequeath to the chiefs and shepherds of the church the right to, to sacrifice uh, to sacrifice to sacrifice instituted by himself the most natural and the wisest development and the best adapted form that is to give it due liturgical form and solemnity now simply put we can understand when it says form and solemnity. How far would it have gone if, we, if, if we're just still pulling up a, well, unfortunately that's what we're kind of doing now in some of our liturgical rites, but we're just pulling up a table and singing some hymns and then having the Eucharistic sacrifice. That's what it probably was in the beginning. And then little by little, after synthesizing and understanding this, and through guidance of the Holy Ghost, little by little, they became to understand more and more. So by the time we get to a thousand years after our Lord, you have certain developments like the foot of the altar prayers become much more uh, formed. And they start to express in such a perfect way what we are trying to express in coming to the foot of the altar. We'll get to that actually today, hopefully. So this form and due solemnity is something that grows up out of the Catholic experience. The, the guidance of, of the sanctifier as the, the soul that animates his church, guiding his children through this, this process of developing and, and bringing solemnity to the rites. Some of the development we could see is before, you never, would, you never genuflected before. I think we covered that here. It was offensive. Genuflections were, were things you did for, like you would never genuflect in front of our Lord before because it would have meant something like death. Well, you wouldn't genuflect in front of the living God if in your culture genuflecting meant uh, dead, death. We do it because for us now it's, it's grown to where we understand it as an act of adoration. You only do this for God. But it wasn't like that for, for centuries. It wasn't that way. So these forms and these solemnities, they adapt and they grow according to uh, the needs of a living, growing church. Not progressive in the sense that we push our will, 
but progressive in the sense that we follow the will of the Holy Spirit, if that makes sense. Easter liturgies have a more eastern, sorry, sorry. Eastern liturgies have a more stable and unchanging character with very little variety in daily celebration of the liturgical year. In Eastern liturgies, it says Easter, but in Eastern liturgies, uh, they have the same thing pretty much every day. They're very rich, very beautiful liturgies, uh, but you're dealing with the same thing for the most part every day. They do it this one set way. It's never been that, that way in the Roman Rite. You're dealing with, an, in, in Western culture, you're dealing with a different, we have a very dynamic. So Western liturgies exhibit a greater variety, fresh life and constant progress. Now progress we mean in a, in a true sense of not the way we think of it today. Progress, like I said, from that being animated by the Holy Spirit, the, the, the soul sanctifier of the church. A progress, what we now refer to as a, a from, from Pope Benedict when he talked about the hermeneutics of continuity. So this, this uh, organic development is what we mean here. Organic development, progress, would, we would use these, that's how they're meaning this word progress in a sentence. For celebration of ecclesiastical feasts and seasons, which are more intimately connected and interwoven with the holy sacrifice. We get that in our, um, the calendar, don't we? In the calendar, we have the different feast days. They, they land at different times. Uh, it's a modern thing to have, like, the Feast of the Sacred Heart, the Feast of our, our, our like these, these feasts that they move around throughout the year. They were highly criticized by Orthodox uh, liturgists at the turn of, the, of this century, uh, last century, sorry, the the 20th century. Uh, but for us, it's completely normal, and we, we think it's a, a beautiful thing. But anyways, there. While the Oriental liturgies, for the most part, contain more lengthy prayers and greater abundance of sy symbolic customs and acts. This is important. Remember this. Their liturgy has more of an abundance of symbolic customs. Symbolic customs. You're going to see in the austerity of the Roman Rite, we're not into symbolic customs. We're not into long, flowery prayers. We are now in the ordinary form, but in the extraordinary form, it was never that way. The closer we got to uh, kind of modern time, even in the uh, uh, extraordinary form, you start to see kind of these, these colics that start to get longer and longer. Whereas if the colic is the prayer that we pray in the beginning, or you have the prayer at the very end, but let's talk about the prayer at the beginning. In the, in, the old, uh, in, the, in the Roman church, during the time of the emperors, those, those prayers were like three lines long. They were these tiny little prayers that said almost nothing, but were so precisely written, they said everything we needed to say. Now we say all kinds of stuff because we just run on and on and on, and it's more about the beauty of what we're saying than the precision of what we're saying. The Romans had precision in what they were saying and weren't concerned about the beauty of what they were saying. In this Greek Orthodox, these Oriental liturgies, there's more of a focus because you're also dealing with the Greek. This is what happened with the Roman Rite when it switched from being Greek, was speaking Greek to Latin. It went from being a bit more abundant, flowery, symbolic, to more austere and being more um, practical. The Western, and especially the Roman Latin Rite, because in the Western Rite you have the Ambrosian Rite, you've got this... Uh, uh, anyways, there's, there was a couple different rites, but we're, to, we're, we're going to talk about the Roman rite because we don't know anything about the other ones. The Rome, I mean, people do. I don't know anything about them. I, they don't interest me one bit. Uh, but you can get all kinds of stuff. If they do interest you, there's all kinds of books probably you can read about them. Uh, they never make any sense to me. I'm just interested in the Roman rite. So the Roman rite uh, is marked by a s significant brevity as well as the dignified simplicity and a marvelous sub sublimity in word and action. This is what makes the Roman Rite beautiful. It, what makes it so beautiful is its simplicity. It's practical. There, when, when people go, uh, maybe I got this quote. I don't think I put it in. I didn't put it in. But there was, um, for the Roman Rite, it's not right for us to, to put all kinds of symbolism into it. To, to be inventing all this, oh, this means this, and it means uh, the, uh, the, the bells. It's, it, we, we use the bell because the bell is the 12 apostles. 
with the, the in their I forget the, the Holy Trinity. You, you have you've got all this symbolism on the handbell that you use at Mass. Well, I'm sorry, the handbell. You just need a bell. You need a, you need a bell. You need a simple little bell. But people they say they got to have this kind of bell with the four bells and each inside of each bell. There's uh there, there's three bells or you have three bells. With three. I can't figure out what they're doing because it doesn't mean anything. Buy whatever bell you want to. I need somebody to ring the bell in the Roman rite. That you got to ring the bell. That's all you got to do. But then they go on all all this kind of symbolism about the bells. That's that has nothing to do with the Roman rite. If that if that tickles you a little bit to know all this symbolism about that bell, that's I guess that's great. But it really doesn't have anything to do with the Roman rite because we just want the bell rung. You got to ring the bell because now you ring the bell because people have to come up here. You ring the bell so people will look up there. You ring the bell. That's it. It's a practical thing. In in France, I think it comes from France. When the Nova, when the extraordinary form of the mass started to take off again after Summorum Pontificum, I had to travel a little bit around the world to, to teach the uh, to teach the liturgy at a couple different places. And I found the same customs everywhere I went. Everybody would. If the dominant unsum dignus of the priest, you know, when he says dominant, right before he receives communion, he says dominant unsum dignus, dominant unsum dignus, and they ring the bell. In a lot of places, they would ring the bell like this. So dominant unsum dignus, ring, dominant unsum dignus, ring, ring, dominant unsum dignus, ring, ring, ring. I heard that. I was like, that's ridiculous. And everywhere I went, they did it. They did it. Well, I don't need to mention the places, but then I realized it came from a video from a group of people in France who made the video and put every custom you can imagine in there that had nothing to do with the Roman rite. Now they're ringing the bell doing all this weird stuff. Well, if you even read the, and you ask people, why are you doing that? Oh, it means this and that. They'll go on to tell you all this stuff. But if you read the Ritu Servandus, what I told you about, that official rubrics, that official explanation of the rubrics that's in the, that's in the missile, it says, and the bell is to be rung after the Agnus Day. Agnus Day, remember the priest goes, Agnus Dei, we told this peccato mon misery. Agnus Dei, we told this And then now we have a silence until it gets to the point where it says, Dominus and Dignus. Well, the rubric just wants you to ring the bell when he's done saying the Agnus Dei, because the people have to come up to the communion rail. If nobody comes to the communion rail, he doesn't turn around and say, Ecce Agnus Dei with the, with the host. See, it was just a completely practical thing. You ring the bell. People know, oh yeah, I, I, I've prepared, I'm gonna, I'm gonna receive communion today. So you go up, you kneel down, server looks back, yep, Father, there's somebody here. So, fa so he rings the bell, and then he climbs the steps and does the confidier because somebody wants to re receive communion. All completely makes sense. Very, very practical. But if you ask somebody normally about, about this ringing the bell thing, they're gonna come up with all kinds of flowery explanations that have nothing to do with anything. That, that has nothing to do with the Roman rite. The Roman rite is very practical. We're very practical. There's simplicity. And that's what makes it beautiful. The ancient Roman rite, uh, just a little bit of quick information on this, and then we'll take a, we'll take a break. Uh, the ancient Roman rite basically was handed down to Pope Innocent I, and he wrote this. Well, I don't know about well, Anyways, sorry, this is Pope Innocent I. This is what he writes. He writes to the Bishop of Gubbio, there's a couple of things he writes to the Bishop of Gubbio that we know about different sacraments. But he writes to the Bishop of Gubbio. Do you know Gubbio? Gubbio is where that famous instance took place of St. Francis, where that wolf was eating, like killing everybody. And St. Francis went and made a deal with, with the, the wolf of Gubbio and said, if, you know, you got to stop killing everybody. And the people will give you food. Then, then he became a very pious wolf. And he would actually, if you go to Gubbio today, it's built on a hill. And he'll... Um, they have all the places in that town where the wolf would go and beg his food every day and the church where he'd go pray. <laughs> I don't know. But that's, the, that's Gubbio. So in the year 402 or between 402 and 417, Pope Innocent I writes a, uh, he writes a, a letter to, now this is pretty early, for, in the 400s, that's still pretty early. He writes to the bishop of, of Gubbio and he says, who does not know that what has been handed down by Peter, the Prince of the Apostles, to the Roman Church is still observed unto this day. That's pretty impressive. Is still observed unto this day and must be observed by all. So we don't, we don't just have a liturgy that just kind of, you had a group of, the Pope said, he got a group of men together and said, work something out. You know, we need to make a missile. They didn't have that before. You, 
you had something that was passed down to them from the apostles, and they diligently kept that, except for being able to expand on certain things, but they didn't change it. It grew, but you didn't take that substance, that form that it had, and just change the whole thing. That's why that missile that comes all the way down to us is the, the missile we have that stops at 1962. That's the one missile. We'll talk about it a little bit here. But in what form and how strictly are we to think of this, this, um, this liturgy given to us? I don't know who this, this uh, Kossing is, but this is a quote from him. As yet a tender plant planted in, this is the quote I gave you before, planted in, in the Roman garden, nurtured and, and assisted by the Holy Ghost, it has grown to a large tree, and although the trunk has long ago attained its full growth, it nevertheless shoots forth in every century new branches and new blossoms. We know from Pope Leo the First. See, these are the three. These are the three sacramentaries that we talk about: sacramentarium, the uh, Leo, uh, Leo, Leonianum, Leonianum, Glazianum, and a Gregorianum. These are the three. The Gregorianum is the most important because it is the one, basically our Mass today, from the 1962 back, is based on. And even most of the, the ordinary form would be based on this as well. At least the substantial like canon and things like that, though they did uh, do, do a few things. So Pope Leo, you got the 400s. Pope um, uh, Gelesius. He's from the, the very end of the 400s, and Pope Gregory the Great is uh, middle end of the, the, the 600s. So these are the three major, but the point being is in them, we have these documents and we can, we can, we can study these. Now these documents show us this constant preservation of something very, very ancient. You don't have new missiles coming into existence. You have the preservation of something being passed down, and each one um, making stronger as they pass it down until you get to great Gregory the Great, who finishes the canon, placing the Our Father just outside of it, fixes the canon the way it is, and by this point in time, now uh, see that. So these popes faithfully preserved the ancient formulas, and at the same time enriched and perfected them with adaptations uh, uh, suitable to the times. So here we have the Kyrie, you can see it in that second bullet point. The, the intro, the Kyrie, the glory, the collect, the epistle, the gradual, the gospel, the secret, the preface, the paternoster, the communion, post-communion. It all dates back to, that, to the 4th century. 4th century is the 300s. Our Mass is principally derived from this one. That is the, the, the Mass of Gregory the Great, or the Sacramentarium of Gregory the Great, because he, he fixes all that. He, he brings it to its completion, for the most part. By the close of the Middle Ages, the close of it, so we're talking what? Um, by, the, by the time we're getting to Council Trent, it had been disfigured greatly. Because you didn't have one fixed liturgy. You didn't have a uniformity in liturgy that we have today. You had the substance of all the liturgy was kept intact. But it was, it was, it was used differently. Basically every diocese would essentially have its own rite. Because you didn't have one missile that got passed around. You didn't have this uniformity. And in fact, it's not a Catholic idea to have complete liturgical uniformity. That's not a Catholic idea. Everybody has to be doing the same thing. We've never had that idea before. But when, when the Council of Trent came along and Pius, it got passed down to uh, St. Pope Pius V, he had to finish the missile off. Their job was to carefully revise, you see on the, well, the last bullet point, to carefully revise and correct the missile. So it's a difference between coming up with a mass. A lot of times they want to make us think that the Council of Trent, they did a reform, they gave us a new missile. That's not what happened. They were sorting through... This is real liturgical uh, reform. It's when you take all the things that have grown up around the Mass and you trim it all back, you get to the uh, more, more archaic form of the Mass. Not an archaic sense of a Mass already that's developed, but the essential things that have been passed down to us 
in its integrity. You get back to that, so they carefully revised and corrected the Missal, restoring the Gregorian rite to its original purity uh, and dignity, while also establishing unity and divine worship. Now this time they had to establish unity, which I just said wasn't really a Catholic principle, because they had to save Christendom. You had, you had all these attacks on the liturgy now with all these heretical groups now changing the Eucharistic prayers to communion services, and, and we saw what happened to England. Once they embraced, they had the apostolic faith, and once they embraced the Lutheran communion services, service prayers in their book of commons or their book of uh, prayers, whatever they call it, then, then they lost the sacrament. Then they lost holy orders, and that's why they don't have priests anymore, and anybody can be ordained there in the Anglican church because they don't have... They're not, a, they're not an apostolic church any longer because they changed the, the essence of the Mass. So let's take a break. But before we do, are there any questions? Don't worry. No, remember, we didn't have a whole lot of uniformity. The, the, they always had their own, they always had their own um, right. The Orientals had a different way of doing things. Remember, they had a different language. They had different customs. But the essential things from the apostles were always found in all of them. You'll always find in every rite the kind of the same substance. But the Roman rite was guided by different principles, different people, different culture, different needs, different, different, different un understanding of solemnity uh, and decorum. And then the, uh, the Orientals, they had theirs. And so theirs developed out of that need, ours developed out of our need. And that's why theirs isn't really, it's not very dynamic. You have what you have. And it's beautiful and very rich, but they do pretty much the same thing always. Where ours depends on, it's more dynamic, you know, what, what, what's the feast day, what, what's, the, what's the part of the year, what's our calendar suggesting. Things will change and grow. There's that organic progress or the or, or organic development. Does that make sense? I'm sure others know, but it's like the foreign country. Sure. Well, Oriental is Eastern, so it means the same thing. Eastern, Oriental, we just mean, you know, over there somewhere. But Western is is like, you know, Europe would have been Europe here in America. We're, we're Roman, Roman. Uh, Constantinople, uh, Alexandria, those 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 uh, those those major centers that had patriarchs. That's that's the East. Now even Russia, I guess, is considered the East. All oh, that's East. But we're we're West. Yeah, but when we say Eastern Orthodox now, we tend to mean a group that's outside the church. That they're not the they're of apostolic origin, but not in union with Rome. But there's all kinds of groups now. When you get into Eastern, when you get to the Orthodox, when you get to the Coptics, all these different that are in union with Rome. So it gets kind of complicated. I don't really know a lot about the different rites, unfortunately. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, mass definition is derived from ethnicity. Well, the definition of mass would be different, but the, the, the significance of the word mass derives from misa, di dismissal. And that's where the ita misa est, a mass is ended, you go. That's why in the, in the ordinary form of the mass now, they say the mass is ended, you can go in peace. They just add something to it. Or I think most people now, there's, they have a couple different formulas you can say, like go and like live the gospel with your life or something like that. Yeah, so I'm trying to figure out where the word mass derived from. From Misa, being dis the dismissal. When they're telling you you're dismissed, the word's Misa. And so mass comes from that. Because most likely they were using that as a code word for the Holy Sacrifice, the Eucharistic celebration. So then Christ Mass, Christmas, Christ Mass. Christmas, yeah. Yeah. Mass Yeah, because that's a later development. So they were probably already using Misa for Mass when they started having the, the Feast of Our Lord's Nativity. I mean, I don't know. I'd have to look it up, but I, I, I presume. John? So, I've heard someone say organic development. That would be like, if something's animated by the Holy Spirit, they were using the example that if you came to Mass, 
one week after the other, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between something changing. No. It's so close. Is that true or not? It's like, it's like evolution. You know how we never see the links between evolution? It's just like that. <laughs> no, just kidding. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's just, it's something that over a long period of time becomes, it gets better and better. It just, it builds, it's just like kind of, uh, grace builds on nature. It's the same thing. We have this, for example, I mean, one of the examples I always like to give is the lifting of the chasuble, which we talked about a couple weeks ago. Uh, that was a practical need. But then it, it also serves to show something very significant that we do serve as a, we, we do assist at Mass more than just being present at it. Um, so you have these practical needs that happen, and over time they get given more um, decorum, more solemnity, more form within the Mass, and that's where the, the beauty starts to come from is this need is here, 